Welcome back to Tech Talks. I'm your host, Jack Brandwood, and this is the podcast where I speak to some of the brightest and most influential people in the tech industry. This week, I sit down with founder over at Rismart, Ryan Swan. Our conversation ranges from why you should hire a CTO sooner rather than later, the value of the tech scene and being heavily involved in it, and how being too early might not be a good thing. The chief risk officer role was always saying, well, you've got the CEO, we've got the chief finance officer. It's always the kind of, oh, who wants to do this role? I'll give it to that person. Mm -hmm. Last three or four or five years, we've seen the importance of that role massively increase because actually people realise, well, there's no point generating tenors at the front door if we're throwing 20s out the back door. For more information on this episode and Tech Talks, head over to tech-it.co.uk. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the episode. Hi Ryan, thanks for coming on. You're welcome, yeah, good to see you. Good to see you too. Yeah, I'm loving the branded um, polo. Y- yeah, we're trying to, to kind of keep that, that on brand as we, as we kind of can do. So yeah, the little uh, little R logo, which symbolizes the wrist smart, which is, which is useful. So yeah, hopefully, you know, we'll have it across billboards around Manchester in the next few uh, next few years. But Absolutely, I don't see, I don't see why not. Definitely. Um, well, look, I, I always like to start these uh, conversations with a, a kind of broad, deep question. Who is Ryan Swan? Where do we start? I suppose so. Ryan Swan is the is the founder of of kind of RiskSmart. Um, so we're a governance risk and compliance platform. You know, we, we're targeting um, small uh, to medium sized teams in in risk management and, and helping them to, to just make their lives easier. Basically, is, is kind of part of of who we are. Um, I'm also a former chief risk officer. I'm a former fintech kind of lawyer. Um, I'm a Manchester City fan. Um, I don't know what else you kind of want to know, uh, but it's a little bit of a, of a kind of background about who I, who am I. Manchester City fan, did we not bet him before he, he came onto the cheese? Um, no, fantastic. Well, we'll get into it in a little bit more detail. Um, something that we always do with our guests when we come on uh, is, well, as you know, our vision is to create a world where everyone gets their dream job. And I know you didn't always want to be a chief risk officer, I assume. So can I ask you to draw something for me? Yeah, sure. Can you draw what you wanted to be? before you were the Ryan Swan we know today. <laughs> are, you, are you good at drawing? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the best. My daughter's actually really good at We were playing a game last night actually on there. Uh, we had to do Disney characters and you had to then you picked a card where they're doing an action and you had to draw the Disney character and then the action they were doing. So balancing a jar on the head or jumping out of a cake and things like that. So yeah, my wife was brilliant at it. Mine were kind of like, mm, what, what is that? I can't even work out the character never mind what they're doing. So we'll see, we'll see what, what kind of are. Yeah, it's always safe to go stick. Yeah. I think that's the, uh, I'm not sure this expression I should have on my face on this one. I mean, you'll see it afterwards. I probably would have one of these on as well, actually. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, so that's the, the picture. What, what is, did you want to be in a horror film? Is that the... Almost, yeah. So, yeah. There's, so there was two things I used to, so I started off, I wanted to be an architect. Um, started looking into that when I was, I don't know, sort of 12, 13, maybe. Uh, and then real, I think realised in terms of actually, I think there's, I think it takes like, seven, eight years to kind of qualify and everything else. And thought, mm. then I think I got my drawing skills and was like, maybe I'm not you know, not set out for an architect kind of life. So I've put that one there because then I changed to become totally the other side and was thinking about being a pathologist. So and I think there was a, I can't remember the name that I said at the, at the time of a, a TV series on, on like BBC One around it. And I used to watch, I think we used to watch that and was kind of into the, the crime kind of element of it, of this pathology. So I thought, oh, yeah, that's kind of, a, that looks really interesting because, you know, this this lady kind of pathologist, but then got involved in the in the crime kind of documentary and how that kind of worked and discovering kind of what happened and I suppose solving those kind of problems, right? Or solving those kind of mysteries around how it, how it developed. Maybe that's where my brain maybe went to as part of that. So yeah, pathology. And then um, I suppose then I, I think then I realised actually mm, I'm a bit squeamish in terms of blood and that kind of stuff, you know, just about the dentist well that's about it so thinking maybe, maybe that's not the career to kind of go um but i think there was that i suppose there was almost that that maybe led me into law actually because there was a you know sort of going back to who i'm at when i was then sort of 16 17 went on a bit of the the kind of um work experience kind of stuff went and went into um barristers chambers so within the legal kind of sphere going in sort of shadowing criminal barristers so i was really intrigued by that kind of world in terms of um you know the, the legal concept of it but actually the the solving of those kind of problems, mysteries, actually finding out in terms of the justice kind of element, uh, shadowed those criminal kind of barristers. And I guess that's where um, I then decided, you know, not to not to pursue that kind of angle um, in terms of criminal law, but then went and did the, the kind of law degree and can talk through in terms of where that kind of led me to. So, yeah, I think going back to it, there was obviously something down there that, well, you know, went down the wrong track in terms of pathologies, not for me, but the... Uh, 
yeah, the, the kind of mystery element maybe was intriguing. Oh, how your life would have been different if you t- ended oh, yeah. up being a pathologist. Yeah, exactly. I'm not sure where I would have been if, if, if it had gone down that way. Probably tried to get into the TV element and say, oh, no, I don't really want to do it on, on, on sort of uh, on dead people. I want to just pretend and go and uh, come with a film star instead. There you go. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, exactly. Have you name in lights either way? So obviously talked about the career that you wanted to go into, be the pathology or architecture ended up becoming the chief risk officer which is what happened before risk mart yeah. i guess when you when you were a kid what were you like as a kid what was i like as a kid i uh, was so very sporty okay. still kind of into into the kind of sport not as much these days but yeah i used to play a lot of sports so uh, you know football tennis i think i i remember represent, i got into rugby at one point as well so um went to school high school was always a football kind of player rather than rather than rugby and then actually missed the missed the um the trials or whatever for the for the for the school team so thought it was on a on a thursday or whatever um it was on a wednesday went you know went to the p teacher on a thursday oh, i'm here for the trial no you've missed it i've already picked the teams now oh why i want to play well sorry can't do it so quite a harsh lesson so okay right the rugby trials are, are next week instead i'll go and do that so i ended up playing playing kind of rugby union and, and did okay on that got to i play i represented lancashire for a couple of kind of games and and so sort of there's northwest kind of school teams which was which was kind of good so yeah very sporty uh sort of family orientated so you know close to my got a younger kind of brother we used to do kind of a lot together as as part of that um and uh, yeah you know just uh nothing really that that kind of exciting i, I suppose in terms of is that kind of childhood I, you know had a, had a good kind of supportive kind of uh, family behind us which is great still close obviously family is important to me so you know close close-knit uh close-knit family after like university that sort of thing you went you say you went down the, the law route yeah yeah so right. did yeah did um did law at, at university uh uni of, she- uh, of sheffield um which was good and and then i suppose went on that on that kind of track so my dad was a my dad was kind of a lawyer so that, that kind of background of i suppose i got to, to that university and was like what do i need you know pathology architecture chief risk officer in the future as, as you know what do i need to do took, took law as a degree because you know could actually it's a bit of a can open up different kind of doors so i'm not being sidetracked necessarily in something straight away i can see what where i go and i guess i i, I kind of went from there and it was fine I had a good time but didn't didn't enjoy the academic bit as much as you know what I, what i really thrive on is the practicalities of kind of stuff which is you know going back to where risk smart sort of started was around actually there's a lot of theory about risk management well actually let's keep it simple what we're trying to achieve here we're trying to make sure that we're we're keeping businesses resilient that we're adding value that we're you know that we're, we're taking those opportunities where we can do um, so yeah, went went through that kind of um, that kind of journey, and then ended up then going on the on the kind of practical sort of course to to qualify as a as a lawyer as a solicitor. Went in there and then came in house um, uh, into financial services, uh, running that kind of legal team, and developed from there. That you know everything like as a kind of as, as a lawyer in house, everything lands on your desk, right? So it's actually well, that was just going to stick it on Ryan's desk. So it was then compliance kind of things came along, and how, we, how do we do with this regulation? And then that morphed into then risk management. Oh, okay, right, we've got a risk framework. How do we develop that? Oh, let Ryan have a look at that, and let's develop it. And and that's where that that kind of you know chief risk officer role uh, developed. We find this a lot when we speak to people. Right, no one you said then around what do you want when you grow up? No one wakes up and goes, that's it. I want to be a head of risk, I want to be a chief risk officer, I want to be a compliance person. There might be occasional people who do it, but most don't. And we uh, and what we see is actually a lot of people have developed into those roles. So speak to a lot of people, you know, co-op's a great example in Manchester, a lot of people in co-op who, who are in risk management who we speak to who may be still there or have moved on, have actually, they, they started off in, they started off in customer service, they started off some of them in technology, they started off in, uh, you know, in, in the in the branches and actually developed through. And they, they had that, I suppose you've got that, that appetite and that mentality for for either questioning things or going, I'm not sure that's quite right or challenging or that mindset of wanting to learn a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those people have developed into, into that. That's the skill set, right? Of kind of going, okay, really? Is that going to happen next week? You know, have we really got enough cash in the bank or do we really think that product's going to work? And, and asking those difficult questions or challenging, you know, businesses, not being a, not being a yes person, absolutely. Um, so I think that's where kind of developed then into that and that, that risk management side and compliance and then, you know, the world, where we were in in fintech and financial services, the world moved on with the with the regulator in terms of you know a lot more requirements and rules to comply with, and a lot more demands and personal liability for directors. So it became even more kind of important that role. Um, and I think it's it is so now where you know sort of waffling on a little bit, but the chief risk officer role was always saying, well, you've got the CEO, we've got the chief finance officer, you might have the chief operating officer, and they were always actually they're not not the seat around the table. It was always the kind of, oh, who wants to do this role? I'll give it to that person. Mm-hmm. Last three or four or five years, we've seen the the kind of kudos and the the importance of that role massively increase because actually people realise, well, 
there's no point generating tenors at the front door if we're throwing 20s out the back door. There's actually, it's about value protection. It's about making sure we're delivering great customer outcomes. It's about culture, right? Around kind of going there, going, have we got the right culture in our organization? Because that's going to drive a better productivity. So all those aspects is a chief risk officer's kind of role. Chief risk officer, just risk officer, those, those roles around risk, I assume they didn't always exist, did they? No. How many years ago did they come into play? And so I think I think it's, it's like anything. I think it develops in terms of sort of the listed FTSE companies in terms of going, okay, right, we've now got, you know, we've got, we're, we're a lender, we've got credit risk to kind of deal with, or or we're, uh, we're in a highly regulated world. We need, you know, someone to just keep an eye on, on kind of risk management in pharmaceuticals or whatever in those kind of areas. And then I guess the... The kind of the the corporate governance code and the FTSE 100 requirements kind of made that role really important and people kind of you know corporate governance and, and making sure that we were saying the right things to the market and all that kind of stuff that then became a, a key kind of requirement so i guess from there like anything it's kind of filtered down right because then you take the good and the bad practices and, and the smaller businesses go well actually we don't need to comply with this because we're not we're not as big as these plc's but actually that's a really good thing to do and that's good business sense why wouldn't we do that so they take all the good bits of it and create that kind of role without all necessarily the red tape that they don't necessarily need to comply with and that kind of filters down and i think then you know over the last um sort of 15 20 years as as kind of regulation has kind of changed and you know we've had data protection rules come in and we've had payment services rules and and financial services and we had the banking crash which then actually you know the regulator went back again and said okay people weren't behaving how expected and executives weren't doing what they should have been doing it, it means that they put more stringent kind of rules in place and more liability on on individuals which then that elevated that kind of role of saying okay we you know we now need not just an individual we need a a team of kind of people who are supporting and challenging the business on it um because it, it's a kind of you've always had auditors right coming in and auditing every year and saying are the, are the financial statements accurate have we been doing what we should be doing and that was seen as a bit of a the kind of teacher or you know Ofsted coming in and checking kind of things and and they've you know auditors have had that that role over the last few years of changing that that kind of persona of saying actually we're not we're not the kind of the policemen we're not the people coming in just ticking and compliance have gone through that journey as well around it always used to be over here you know they hear the people always say no and actually, you've had to go through a cultural change of, of making sure that you know, it's not people always say no. People always want to under, you know, get people involved earlier. They can understand the problem. If they understand the problem, they can advise better in terms of well, how can we do this to make sure that we're, we're doing it in the right way, in the compliant kind of way, um, which has then led to actually there's, you know, some of these regulations and things have allowed business opportunities for, for other businesses because um, it's opened the doors to things that actually we didn't think we could do that previously. Now we can. That's a, a new revenue source. So. Mm. I think that that whole position has been a load of different factors that have influenced it from, you know, macroeconomic factors through to personal factors around actually the like the directors are responsible for this personally and if it hits them in the pocket, how do we protect ourselves? Um, has created those kind of roles in that risk and compliance kind of culture. Do you know any stories at the top of your head where if someone had a chief risk officer or something like RiskMart that they could have avoided a hef well, firstly a hefty fee or perhaps businesses that have gone under. Yeah, you have absolutely. Yeah, yeah so right. I think it, you mean you look at you look at financial crime in the news at the minute, and some of the fines there are being let. I think you know, sort of Deutsche Bank and people like that's in the news, sort of three hundred million kind of fines that they were they were receiving. And when it boils down to it, whether it's financial crime, whether it's risk management, whether it's kind of cultural things, whether it's you know some of the the fast fashion brands that we've seen go, you know, because actually in the they've been using sort of. Um, unethical sort of methods of how they maybe did that previously in, in different kind of countries. That's all, you know, that's why it's share price by 80%, 90%, nearly sent businesses under, has sent some under. That's all risk management because it's actually, it's looking at kind of what's the risk of us doing this practice? How are we controlling that? Actually, is the board aware of those controls? So, you know, if you just said to some of these boards, right, well, actually, we're not vetting customers properly. We're allowing anyone to borrow, lend money, whether they're a criminal or whether they're a, a sanctioned individual. Oh, and by the way, we're, you know, we're using children in, in kind of certain countries and paying them two pence an hour to develop our clothes. If you gave that information to any, any reasonable person, they would say, well, no, that's not the right thing to do. Why are we doing it? But actually, because, the, you know, again, going back to things get complicated and, and the woods for the trees, people either are not challenged enough internally or actually there's so much information. You know, we've seen board packs and risk committee packs of, of like 150, 200 pages that's sent to people on a Tuesday night when the meeting's then Wednesday afternoon. Well, no one's going to read it. It's like, oh, well, it was on page 321 in the corner. We told you about that. So, you know, big part of our method when, when we were in industry was around keep it simple, guys. You know, look at stuff in terms of keep it on one, two page, visualize things better. So we, we talk in risk about 
rag statuses and you know red amber green and colors and things like that and it it sounds a bit a bit kind of a bit kiddish in a way but it's actually it's you know executives there's a stat out there isn't there they can, you know the intention span of a of a, of a, of a standard exec is whatever you know 10 minutes or something in terms for the end they're not interested in it they just turn off so they've got so many things people going through their, their head and things to do you've got five ten minutes of their attention actually let's keep it on one page in terms of what are five things that could either hurt our business hurt our people hurt our customers and that's the part of risk map where we say actually Keep it simple. Use that kind of so what test. So what is what does that matter? This you know the control over here isn't working right. Well, does that mean that it's going to cost us five pounds? It's going to cost us uh, you know two hours of time, or actually, is it going to take fifty percent of our business, or mean that fifty percent of our staff leave because they don't think it's the right thing to do? Mm-hmm. So you know we really drill down into giving people that snapshot of of what is what's important and what's and what's not. Because like you say, you know these risk events can take businesses can you know can take businesses down can. Can devalue them. Can actually, de- you know, demoralise and lose really good kind of talent. Makes complete sense. Okay, so chief risk officer, where did you come up with the idea for RiskSmart? So RiskSmart was we were at we're our own customers essentially. So we were we were sat in industry. Um, you know, we worked in fintechs, financial services kind of firms. We were working in businesses that you know we weren't at kind of huge global, you know, ten thousand or fifty thousand size businesses. We were working in businesses that were. 500 employees up to sort of a thousand, 2000 size. And we were myself and a, and a couple of others were, were kind of risk. You know, I was a chief risk officer. We had a risk manager. There was like a risk analyst there. And we were, we were developing things and saying, that's a better way to do this. The, the marketing team were using data, the financial, you know, fa- fa- the finance team were using data. And we were kind of sat there going, oh, you know, we're, we're looking at risks on a bit of a, a bit of a spreadsheet by going finger in the air. Do we think that risk is, do you think it's like high this month? Do we think it's low? We don't really know. So we wanted to develop data more to say, actually use a data led approach and actually look at that data to say, well, you know, we think that our our customer or conduct risk kind of score is really good. Well, why is that? Because, well, customer satisfaction scores are, are kind of increasing and getting better. More customers are buying the products. You know, less people are, 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 um, are churning on it. All these different indicators say, actually, we must be doing a decent job there because the data is telling us that. So we we started to develop, sort of, um, develop that as a model and using sort of spreadsheets and everything else. And, you know, one of the guys who founded uh, RiskMart with us as, you know, a kind of analyst, and he was kind of that, uh, and all these, you know, spreadsheets and calculations, and we said, there must actually, let's pause, there must be a there must be a platform out there that can kind of do it. You know, we've got finance team, we've got zero marketing are using HubSpot, there must be a team, there must be a platform for the risk teams, let's go and find it. That was about three or four years ago. We went out there and we found, we you know, we did different demos and spoke to different platforms and some great technology out there, but actually really complex. So, you know, used by used by kind of people like, um, you know, huge PLC companies across different countries that have got, I don't know, four or 500 people just in the risk team. And in terms of, we were sat there going, I don't even understand that. Why would you have that? And what does that mean? And I've got to click 20 buttons to get to a report. And we're just thinking we don't understand it so therefore you know people who are not risk people that we want to sort of use risk management and embed that culture aren't going to understand it so we kind of took a pause and sort of went okay right mm, um, let's go and speak to, to people like us in different industries and they were like yeah you know we use spreadsheets we've tried these platforms they don't work we get quoted you know ridiculous amount of money for them that we can't afford so we sort of took that as an idea and said right okay well, you know we we found that problem now we see others are doing it like you know why don't we go and do, actually rather than just developing it as a uh, as a tool for the business we were working at the time, why don't we take it as an idea? So it was a bit of a snowball from there, really. We we then spoke to to a few more kind of different people in different businesses, got them for further validation, and um, went and started developing a, an MVP. Um, uh, you know, got got some funding that we can kind of come through, uh, come on to, um, and, and developed it. And then the more we saw it, the more we saw regulation coming down the line and businesses going, oh, actually, we weren't really interested in this now, but we are even more so because we're having to, you know, we're having to evidence things to the regulator. We're having, our boards are asking us questions or we've just gone through a, a, an investment or an M&A activity and we got, you know, we got one of the big four consultancy firms that came in and looked at our risk management and we're kind of, we got a bad score out of it, so we need to improve. So that was the, that was the kind of idea that actually there wasn't something out there that was, that was simple, that was intuitive, that was, that was at the right kind of price point. Um, because a lot of that technology has been built by non-risk people. Mm-hmm. So, and we find this internally at RiskSmart when we're sort of sat there with our with our development tech team, kind of going our you know UX designers and going, oh no no, it needs to work like this, guys. And we go, it might work like that in your head as a as a UX or a technology person, but actually in a risk manager's, you go from you know from A to C to B mm-hmm. in a way, and that's just how it works. So, a lot of feedback that we get uh, from customers and and from people that we show the platform to is 
you can see it's been developed by people at, at, at know and have been in that kind of role because actually everything is intuitive in terms of where you then click to next. Um, what we find with a lot of the other platforms out there is actually got to search for that kind of next step and it, and it just means it's really difficult to use. It's interesting that that's, it's quite a, a common story that is someone has a, uh, a scratched itch and they do it uh, and then they realize other people have that same that same scratch that they need to need to get done and and I think the great thing is about show sure about risk smart like you said there you you understand the domain of risk you really do yeah uh, which you know some founders that own certain platforms may may not yeah that's that must give you such a such an advantage yeah it's great it's especially when speaking to customers as well right 100 percent. so the rapport that we can create straight away is actually and this is this is this is a, a plus point and it's a challenge as we grow right because actually in the early days you know the founding team being on those kind of calls speaking to customers selling the, pro- the platform and the product mm-hmm. we we kind of we're not the we're not the kind of the salesperson chatting. So the, the you know the risk managers are as I said earlier they're historically kind of um, intuitively at risk averse because that's just kind of who they are, right? So actually, in terms of being being kind of approached on a on a sales kind of call, in terms of I'm selling a platform, mm-hmm. it's totally different. So look, we've been here. This is what we do. Speaking the right language, you know, speaking same terminology, you straight away create that connection. Or we can say, well, I bet you've got this, this, and this, haven't you? Oh yeah, right. We, exactly. We had that problem last time. So we can, mm-hmm. you know, we can be humble kind of with that. But actually, we, we you know, we, we can just be really kind of transparent around, look, we've been in those kind of situations. And sometimes we, we found it interesting with customers and, and prospects is that they're not embarrassed, but they're kind of, we ask them to send in their, their frameworks and they will load it into our platform. They're like, oh, it's not quite as good as I want it to be. It's like, look, we're not here to judge you. We're here to kind of help you. We're your, you know, we're your best friend in terms of you know, the big thing that we use is we're not, we're not here as a technology team to replace the people. We're here to kind of say, people take telling us that reporting takes them three weeks out of a, a month to pull all the reports together for the board. What? Why? You know, you don't want to spend any time doing that. You let us do that, and we, you know, it takes us a, a couple of hours at a click of a button to be able to produce all those reports and, and send that in that kind of direction. So, yeah, it's it's great. We create that rapport. We can we you know, we see those pain points. We're not just thinking, oh, this could be a problem. We go, oh, this was a problem for us, and we ask the customers and they certainly validate that. The challenge comes from as we kind of grow, we need to. We of course we need to bring in sort of account executives and salespeople to help grow the products and, and business development. But we also need to bring in people that have, have got that risk domain expertise because right. we need to keep that kind of connection. We need to keep that authenticity. And, and you can't, you can't, you, know, you can't chat GPT that authenticity mm-hmm. that is around people understanding. You can, you can't throw a few buzzwords in because the the risk teams and people will, will find you out, right? You, you know, you throw risk framework and risk registers and they go, okay, you know a bit about risk and ask a bit more about you. And if you left, sort of floundering it's going to just totally ruin that that kind of reputation and, and confidence um so yeah challenges is in terms of how we develop our team where we're bringing technology people product people sort of business development and sales and marketing people but actually we're you know we're we're filtering that through with kind of risk knowledge and some of that is part of the training that we're doing with the guys where actually we're you know we don't train people just on the domain that they're involved in marketing sales and tech we we kind of put them on training courses around risk management and compliance so that they can understand it and get a feel for actually what is the customer's real pain points that they're kind of going through going through why someone wouldn't use it price point's not not expensive expensive at all the risk that you're avoiding is can be life-saving sometimes yeah um, you're dealing with people who have biz- domain knowledge that, you know, is really extremely rare. It's very simple to use. It saves people time. Why, why wouldn't someone use it? Do you get? Do you come across any? Yeah, I think the fear of change. So in terms of, I've been doing it, and not a kind of you hear. You know, I've been doing it for years, so it's fine. People know they need to change, but. Mm-hmm. And I've been there, right? Where you go in, I know this will improve what we want to do. Yeah. I know it will save me time in the long run. I know I'll be able to evidence things and, and be um, have better reporting. But actually, it's not a plug and play, right? There, you know, it's easy to implement and we're not going to spend 12 months implementing a product necessarily. It's usually a 12 week kind of cycle to get that kind of all up and running. But it's still, dev- you know, the, the, the risk team has still got to devote time to it. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes it's that kind of, oh, you know, is it the right? It's never the right time for some for some customers. Oh well, it's not quite right yet because we've got this audit coming up, or it's not quite right because we've got a, a board meeting, or we've got an offsite event coming, and it's kind of sometimes they need to kind of grasp the nettle where we try and help them and educate around. Look, we're we're here to support you on it. It's not a you purchase us and then you know we wave you goodbye. We're very much focused on that customer support. Mm-hmm. Again, what we see from competitors is that 
they take you know weeks to come back to customers they want to add a new user onto the product and they, and they have to wait you know days to do that so we we're very much around we're here to support you on that we understand those challenges we want you to input into the products if there's a if there's a feature that you're demanding you know tell us about it we want to get it on the roadmap so we can build that for you so i think in terms of the the fear of it is sometimes the the fear of change i think sometimes the the risk managers and risk teams you know are really kind of bought into it and love it but actually like anything it's the buy-in internally because some businesses see risk as a bit of a tick box. Oh, we've got to do an assessment. No, we've got to do an AML assessment every year, haven't we? And we send that off somewhere. And I think he's educating CFOs and CEOs to the point earlier around that. It's not just around ticking a box and saying I'm compliant. It's around making sure I've got the right culture. It's around if I'm in manufacturing, looking at that supply chain. It's around looking at, you know, are my, are my people motivated enough? That's all risk management. That's all stuff that our platform can kind of monitor and engage and get information from the HR team to say, are we, is that, you know, are they trained in the right kind of way? And well, hold on, you know, 50% of people haven't completed the training courses that we suggested and we can see a dip in productivity and, and using just data to be able to just look at those different points. So big thing that we're doing at the minute is just supporting those risk teams on that. You know, how do we... You know, we, we have things to help them through business case templates and things like that to say, actually, you know, this will get you internal buy-in, but it's bringing that bigger so what test. So, you know, what does a CFO really, you know, really care about in terms of uh, risk management and how do we help them on that kind of journey? Because sometimes it is a, a risk culture piece that they're on that journey to, to go through. And the risk manager might be the sole person in there. They might have a team around them where they've got a couple of couple of allies you know the tech team are obviously often really really kind of key to saying actually this can make us more efficient and it's really kind of good and we've got cyber security risks that we need to kind of control because our platform can can manage those kind of frameworks and, and do that on, on kind of obligations and compliance but yeah having that conversation and we're really open on that you know we we, we we're off as a personally i'm sort of saying well i'll come and sit at your risk committee i'll come and sit in front of your board and just talk to them for half an hour we don't you know we we have a product advisory board which is really interesting because what we see on that case is we're the vendor, right? So actually, of course, we'd say that our platform's brilliant and you should buy it and it's going to change your world. But actually, what, what we've developed is a product advisory board, which is people who, you know, one lady's on there who used to be a director at the FCA in, uh, for sort of eight or nine years. And, and some of them have been chief risk officers at, at large, you know, really large global kind of businesses. And, and so really good variety um, of kind of individuals there on that advisory board are challenging us in, is that the right feature of the products and how we're thinking about the pricing and what the customers kind of want? But what we've got as well is them offering to say, we'll we'll go and speak to the board. We'll go and speak to those non-exec directors and just have a five, 10 minutes Teams call and say, look, I've been in the industry. This is what I kind of think and help them sort of educate because part of it is an education. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'd be surprised sometimes that you kind of think, well, some of these more mature businesses and, and the businesses that are turning over millions and billions, actually they'll have it all sorted. And we thought that when we came in. Spreadsheets are still the order of the day there. And actually some of the people even at the top of those of those organizations don't quite still get it and there's a there's a journey there to go on we don't have a big enough voice yet to to kind of promote that but actually we're we're building partnerships with some people that kind of do to say actually it's a risk culture thing sometimes around doing the right kind of thing you know you shouldn't be doing something just because a regulation says that you have to do it um, and, and equally you shouldn't always do something just because you can do it there's a balance there to say well we can do it but should we do it is it the right thing to kind of do um, and there's a there's an education as part of that is there a certain size business that that risk smart wouldn't be right for yeah so i think the, you know the really kind of large kind of huge businesses i think we uh we kind of say we're probably you know you probably want more complexity just because of you're a complex organization sure. and we think that actually the time and effort and spend doing that just wouldn't be right for you equally we you know we really we really get a buzz from working with high energy kind of businesses mm -hmm. so we, we've spoken to businesses in the past that have you know, been quite large and, and, and everything else and we've got good feedback from the products i think what what frustrates us on some of those conversations is the time and it takes to kind of things around so things take you know six months just to move to the next kind of stage mm -hmm. and, and, and i think what what we kind of really like is those businesses that are that are kind of innovative that, that want to kind of grow and they understand it and um and move at kind of pace and not everyone does we get that we've got to have a you know there's processes to kind of go through but yeah working with those it sort of energizes us as a team and we you know gives us that that kind of pace of our kind of product roadmap so yeah if you're if you've got sort of a hundred, you know, fifty, hundred thousand employees across fifteen different locations around the world, and and a risk team of five hundred, we're probably not the right platform for you. If you, you know, if you've got a, a business size of of kind of fifty through to 
uh, you know, three to five thousand or, or something like that, and risk teams of, of anything from from kind of zero all the way to sort of twenty. You know, as a, as a rough estimate, that that's the right size. But we we're, we're developing the products even more through different use cases as we you know every day. Mm-hmm. So we, we started off with risk management and risk managers. We you know we're, we've got a compliance module that we now have in terms of allowing compliance teams that have two sides of the same coin, right? They're looking at the same kind of data information, but they're looking at it more with a, a you know a, a regulatory kind of lens and are we complying with this and how we're doing with it. Um, we're speaking with security kind of teams and, and cyber and info security and CISOs because actually they've. You know, we're ISO 27001 uh, accredited ourselves wow. and, and actually using our platform to get audited and get through that. The auditor was kind of like, wow, this is amazing. So we've got that validation and we're using that now with with those risk security teams where they're managing those frameworks and compliance. And we just recently onboarded a you know, really, hopefully we'll, we'll announce it in the next few few weeks, but, a, a, you know, really kind of household name who are, are using us across their security team wow. and just to just to manage security risk across their business, you know, and their they're turning over, you know, billions of pounds, right? So we're, it isn't just around the the size of the organisation. It's sometimes around the the right fit for kind of us. And if you want to do risk in a in a kind of simple kind of way, in a intuitive kind of way on our interface, but still have the complexity under the under the hood, then you you know you, you kind of you you're right for us. Yeah, and on that tech piece as well. First of all, how long has Risk Smart been going? Uh, so we founded the business in sort of late 2020. So just obviously coming out of COVID. So, uh, you know, sat at home, working from home, thinking of different things. And, and that was another one. The founding thing was around, you know, sort of funny story was sort of on a, we were sort of just away for a few days with my wife and we were sat there and you have more time. We were thinking about different stuff. And she was like, well, you know, you've you got all this and we're working on all this. And we, and we used to get told in industry as risk teams, with client teams, when we got in auditors in and things like that, we got, we used to get told that's a guy, you know, you're, you're a small kind of team. You're not a massive organization, but you're, you're doing, you're doing things. You're well ahead of some of these bigger businesses that we speak to and things like that. We're not blowing our own trumpet, but we always got good validation. So part of it was kind of, you know, supportive wife kind of in my ear sort of saying, well, you know, people are always telling you, you guys are doing things really well. Why don't you go and do it for yourselves and do something else? So part of the risk smart kind of story was having that, that confidence to kick on because going back to, you know, when we started it in 2020, we were in industry, we were kind of, you know, in paid kind of jobs and taking that leap from going, actually, we're, we're, we're just part of a bigger organization now to be in, actually, it's us. We're responsible, you know, we're responsible for making sure that staff get paid. We're responsible for the product. We're responsible for going out and getting those kind of features and, and selling it and developing it. It sounds great and you can sketch it out on a PowerPoint and you can go, oh, this would be great. And you can do a little, you know, model on a fan- on a spreadsheet and say, oh, we'll do this and we'll do that. And that's great, right? But actually having that leap of faith to go, we know we're going to do this, mm-hmm. sometimes takes a, a bit of kind of courage. And I think we probably still would have done it, but it's good having people around you that challenge you to go, don't do that, but equally give you that confidence to go, no, I think you should go for it. Um, and part of that was the, yeah, it was kind of, you know, family saying, go and have a go. It's almost great that they're not, they're not involved in the industry. So they can they can look at it like a, a almost like a childlike na- naivety, yeah. You know, which is sometimes what you need because sometimes you can be too, you know, risk averse um, and and not understand that. Just give it a go. Yeah, try it out. What's yeah. the worst that can happen? And I you think know? you've got to be. I think I've learned, you know, going through starting up, you know, going through different phases and going through different senior kind of roles in an industry. You kind of learn each phase, right? You you come out. I don't know. You come out of uni and you're doing the junior ones and you think, well, you know, a partner in a in a risk firm or a law firm or the CEO of a business. Mm-hmm. Wow, they they must know everything about it. And how do they understand everything? As you go through it, you realize that, you know, everyone's just trying to find stuff and work it all out, right? They're not, mm-hmm. they don't know everything about everything. There's some people there are chances as well, right? So you've seen yeah. that where you've been sat around different tables going, I know that's not true, but anyway, that's the answer the firm has given them. And you, and you kind of go through that, that, go through that kind of process. Um, so I guess that, you know, I've kind of grown up massively over the last sort of 10 years, but just having that mentality, once you get that right around actually, everything's not always going to be rosy. You're going to fall over and you've just got to dust yourself off and, and carry on. Uh, you're not going to get everything kind of right. You don't know everything about everything. Uh, and, and that's been a big part for us because I've all, as part of the culture of Risk Smart, I've always wanted us to have that freedom to kind of go and develop and grow and understand. And I've, one, we've not had the time because actually we're, we're a startup and we've been building and, and building fast. We don't have the time to, to macro manage, even if we ever wanted to, and we never would do. That's allowed us to bring those people in, digital marketing, for example, on content and brand, where we've got guys kind of go, you know, coming up with ideas to me. I've not even been involved in for, for kind of weeks going, what do you think about this? And it's amazing. And it's brilliant to see them kind of growing and getting that kind of buzz. Then we're getting that recognition in in industry, um, as well as then developing the kind of product. So it's a really, you know, it sounds cheesy, right? But it's a really kind of team effort. And it has to be because each individual that we're kind of bringing in, 
has got to have kind of skin in the game, has got to want have that kind of mindset and ownership mentality. Well, that's it. We've got as part of that sort of trade off, we've got to give them the freedom to grow. We can't be then saying, right, we're bringing in a, a, a new full stack dev. Well, that's it. Well, this is what you have to do and you can't move around it and want you to do that. We've got to give them a bit of freedom to go and be creative um, because they're going to bring ideas to the table that we didn't kind of think about. Um, and that allows us to go on as a, as a business. Going three years, you're now currently how many people? Um, so we are sort of approaching sort of 15 kind of people. people. And you've recently hired a, a CTO, right? Yeah. Um, some would argue quite early on in your um yeah in your existence yeah i guess why did you do that and what are the benefits to doing that yeah no it's a good question jack and i think people have kind of looked at us sometimes on stuff as, as we've grown because what we've always you know well, actually well, you only this you know, you've got to, you know we went and got a, a crm in place really early we brought two business development sdr um, guys in place eight months before we had a product right. because actually what we wanted to do, we never wanted to stop. We wanted to keep momentum. For me, momentum is everything in business. We need to keep that momentum. We never wanted to get to a stage where we go, oh, we've grown a bit quicker than we thought. And actually now we've got to pause and we've got to go and grind. Because you know, more than anyone, finding good people, you can't just go out there and get some good people and they start the next day. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's tough to, to get the right kind of talent. So we've always wanted to make sure that we, we might be a bit early on some of these kind of hires or how we think about stuff. But actually that means that when we get to that next phase, we're not waiting, we're not pausing for three months, we're carrying on that momentum. And equally, we've got, we're not gonna get everything right. So there's some things where we go, and we should have done that a bit, you know, we shouldn't have done that at that time and we spent a bit of money and we, we, you know, we, we don't want the right thing to do. But actually I think more often than not, we've got that kind of decision right. So the technology part, we, you know, was, was the same. We're, you know, we're a technology kind of business. We were, you know, we partnered with some, some really good partners as part of that MVP build and how we kind of grew that kind of product. But, you know, one, we needed to have the, the expertise in house. Two, we think we can go kind of quicker kind of with that. Um, and just having that that kind of team, you know, camaraderie of having the having having Rich, you know, a CTO around the kind of table, get challenges and ideas, thinking about not just today, but thinking about tomorrow. Because mm -hmm. as a, you know, as a, as a non-tech kind of founder, I don't know everything about that kind of technology side. So, you know, we would have created a load of technical kind of debt where I go, no, I've done much about that, carry on. We want to continue to make sure that we have that startup kind of young company mindset to to do that 80 20 to get there to that next stage to keep going to keep going but equally we don't want to back ourselves into a corner we don't want to be re rebuilding a platform in three years time when we've got 500 customers because we thought oh actually we didn't think about this thing or we've gone into america we've gone into australia into canada and we're thinking oh the platform's not quite right for those jurisdictions for whatever reasons we're constantly thinking two or three steps ahead and part of that was was kind of bringing rich in we think you know the value there in terms of that understanding that network and um, how we think about productizing the, the you know the products as we grow um and we've got into you know being totally honest we probably we've attracted enterprise level customers quicker than we thought we've taken customers away from competitors we've we've sold into into enterprise and brought those customers across which it, so that brings an extra level of complexity on security and requirements and things like that so it, it's great that we've managed to to prove that we can do those and you know prove to the world prove to our investors that we can that we can develop the business in that way but that means that with that brings some extra challenges to go okay we might have thought this was going to happen 12 months time it's happened a bit early therefore we need to make sure we've got the right kind of resource and people around us on that so risk smart again three years 15 people um of course plenty of growth is going to be happening over the next 12, 12 to 18 months for other people out there listening to this podcast who perhaps have an idea or similar to you had a found out they had a, a scratched itch. What advice would you give them? You know, they've got that idea, they want to do something about it. What's, what's the next steps? Yeah, so I think go with your gut is amazing. I'm a big believer in that in terms of if you think it's the right thing to kind of do, take a chance on yourself, believe in yourself. I think go and speak, you know, get involved in the, the Manchester kind of startup kind of community, the tech community, go and speak to kind of people. So we, we kind of, I probably did that a little bit, but maybe a bit, a bit insular. And I think since founding Risk Smart, we went on the Barclays um, Eagle Lab sort of dish accelerator scheme and we've, you know, we've met people kind of like, like you guys and Tact and others and in, in different, the different Manchester kind of technology connections. Mm -hmm. I think had I known or got involved in those a bit earlier, I'd have been made more kind of connections and probably made things, decisions quicker. Mm -hmm. Because I think having that, having that network of just going speaking about some ideas, one, everyone's really welcoming on it. Two, you can sit at home and Google and look on websites and find that information, but actually, Going at these events and speaking to someone that goes, oh, I, what I found is people have either, oh, I did that and this that wasn't the right way to do it, do it this way. Or, oh, I did that and it was the right thing to do. Great, it's validated my thinking. Or often, I didn't do that, but I know someone who has. And within, you know, with the next day, there's an, there's an email in your inbox connecting you with someone. So that, you know, don't underestimate the power of that kind of community. Uh, have confidence in your, in your convictions. I think 
you know, funding wise, there's some really good sort of pre-seed um, sort of angel networks, other investor, you know, more institutional investors out there as well that, are, that happens to support growing businesses, especially in Manchester. Mm. So, you know, the world's your oyster really in terms of if you've got a, a, an idea, but validate it, you know, don't do, don't do too much too soon. Validate it each kind of step uh, and grow it, grow it that way. There's a mad community of, of, of tech startup founders in, in Manchester. It's incredible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's just, just tons of event, events that are happening. Yeah. It kind of just makes sense. Even if I guess you, you've, you've only just got that idea and you're not doing anything with it and you're still in full time employment and you're not, you're not even starting anything, going to these events would, would, would maybe give you that motivation to do something about it, right? Yeah, definitely. We won the Northwest kind of um, rising stars for Tech Nation, right? right? Yeah. Tech Nation, obviously, Tech Nation, that was the other fallen one, away, which is, which is sad, but it, I think the, the ethos is still around with pe different people who were part of that are continuing, like at Baltic Ventures, as, as a good example. Um, but even just having the, you've got to enjoy what you do every day, right? You've got to enjoy, if you're not enjoying it, then why are you doing it? So actually going into some of those rooms and just getting that buzz of other founder founders and there'll be some ideas and businesses that you kind of go, I'm not sure that'll work or you don't believe in it, but it, but you've got to respect the passion that those people have got for that. And I think that just having those, you know, I, I try now to to be a bit selective because I think you can, you can get, you could spend your whole day going to events and different kind of things. So I try and be selective around actually, you know, we've got to keep heads down and build the products and everything else. But equally, we've got to be not so insular that we don't understand what's kind of going on. Uh, and just having that energy in those kind of rooms, speaking to different kind of founders, technology kind of teams, getting ideas that you haven't even thought about that totally different business to yours, but you go, okay, yeah, that's interesting because that's the same problem that we had and they've solved it that way. And you straight back to the office to think about stuff. So, yeah, I think it's a really kind of exciting time in the Manchester ecosystem, especially. Very exciting. And uh, I know we met, God, it must have been six months ago or something like that. Or yeah, I think so. so. Something about crazy. That. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so six months ago, I was here today what do we need to keep an eye out for uh, with RiskMart uh, over the next 12 to 18 months? Um, so I think we've we obviously, you know, we've got big ambitions to, to continue to grow as, you, as you'd expect. I think we're, you might see us popping up in, in you know, in, in the US or Canada in the next in the next few months as well as we as we develop into those kind of markets. Um, you know, we're building out our building out our team as we've talked through, but we're also building out partnerships. So as part of that kind of world, you know, we we understand that we're part, we're just one element of an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So whether you're a, you know, a risk team, a security team, whether you're you're needing kind of people as part of that through recruitment, whether you're needing consultancy services, there's there's a lot of businesses and, and we don't want to do everything to everyone. We want to create a, an ecosystem where Risk Smart is part of that mm -hmm. and we're plugging into to, um, you know, into recruitment firms that can say, actually, you're speaking with with risk and technology and compliance teams. We're plugging into to consultancies as we've talked about was we're, we're connecting with other other reg tech providers right so security tooling out there or third-party risk management that we kind of don't do uh, specifically actually connecting with those best-in-class providers mm -hmm. so that we can then support those kind of customers so yeah a lot a lot of kind of growth as we kind of grow through and um, we just you know we just secured another another funding round last week as well which will be will kind of being announced so wow. we've we've kind of got that so we've got you know we continue to get the support of of our kind of investors um next year think will be a, a big kind of milestone for us as we as we kind of come onto the stage properly because uh, we started the business in in 2020 but actually you know the pro we, we're building the product for two years we've the product's been live in the market since sort of february this year uh, january this year really um in terms of in terms of size so yeah still still early days but enjoying it loving it a lot of challenges um a lot of things that we don't get right but uh, keep moving forward each day i'm so happy for you mate and uh and look last question i always like to finish on is if today was your last day on earth yeah, and you weren't on this fantastic podcast and of course spending time with family and that sort of thing, yeah. what would Ryan, Ryan Swan be doing? Gosh, that's a difficult one. <laughs> we talk about actually a fun thing, uh, you know, I was sort of talk about home, just having a laugh is around that. What, I'm big and quite probably tell by, by sort of me, but I quite like my food as well. So we always talk about that. The last, what's your last meal be? What's your best kind of meal and things? And we go through, oh, what, you know, food on this side. And Ryan's always, well, you know, it sounds like really kind of classic Englishman or something. Oh, you know, fish and chips. Love fish and chips. So probably, probably sat there on a beach or somewhere eating eating fish and chips, chilling out. Yeah, not not very exciting. I'm not I'm not that an exciting kind of guy. I think it's, in this scenario, it's the end of the world, right? You want to chill out before before it all goes under. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So if you see me on a beach eating fish and chips <laughs> and there's a bit of a dark cloud, then just be yeah, maybe just be a bit worried. Yeah, peg it. I might know something you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, look, thank you so much for coming on, mate. It's, it's great to hear how quickly Risk Smart has grown and that everyone's realizing how fantastic it is. 
congrats on the the recent award northwest business insider yeah yeah we got that as well which is good yeah, yeah. uh the investment and the impending growth and yeah I'm, I'm excited for people to see what what risk smart's looking like in 12 to 18 months yeah no great great to great to chat to you as always and uh, yeah look forward to to continue to do so great stuff cheers thanks mate and that's it for this week's episode thanks so much for listening and i really hope you enjoyed it Anything we talked about will be linked in the show notes. And if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And we'll catch you on the next one.